Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. Will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world. The way it was and the way it is in your memories. All right, everybody. Welcome to the preview episode of uh, the Retro Disney World Podcast. This is a brand new podcast for those of you who have been following us on RetroDisneyWorld.com. Uh, my name is Todd McCarty. I'm your host for the show. I've got an additional three sidekicks along with me. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what the podcast is all about this time around. And uh, since it's our first one, uh, we want to kind of kick it off uh, with a overview of who we are overview of what we're going to be doing and uh, so first we're going to talk about and introduce everybody and then we're going to get on to some uh, pre-opening discussion all about uh, Disney World before it opened and the different things that went on and then we'll get on to some of the other uh, ideas that we've got for the format of the show. So uh, before I introduce the rest of the team just want to give you a little background about myself. Uh, I myself uh, started going to Disney World in the in the early 80s. Uh, my first trip was there in 80 or 81. I'm still foggy about the date. I should probably get that nailed down. And um, my grandparents were uh, wonderful in taking us many, many times um, throughout my childhood. And uh, I used to go down there and really kind of absorb not only the rides and attractions and having fun with my family, but really start to absorb the way that the parks were built, designed, and um, everything from crowd flow uh, as well, and, and just you know really absorbing that the whole feeling that Disney World gave you. Uh, that continued on uh, into the early 90s. Uh, I started a book uh, called uh, The Very Unofficial Guide to Walt Disney World. It's kind of a play on Bob Selinger's book, The Unofficial Guide. And uh, essentially, I, I gave it away. This is the pre-internet days. I gave the book away on um, bulletin board systems. So for those kids out there that don't know what the internet is, this was a dial-up with your phone and make all these funny noises with your computer and dial into America Online and all that stuff. And uh, you would go ahead and uh, download this book for free, and I eventually wound up self-publishing it for a number of years, and um, eventually you know, started off uh, creating DisneyCorner.com out of that, which became a pretty good one of the very first early Disney forum sites. Uh, from there, I honestly I fell away from the Disney World for a bit, got married, had a kid, and uh, not until I took my own son down there when he was uh, three did I start uh, having a you know rekindled interest in in, in Disney World. Um, and I started collecting, and always have, uh, a lot of retro merchandise, retro th pamphlets and papers and whatnot. And uh, as a result, I kind of wanted to put all those together, and that's what started RetroDisneyWorld.com. And before you knew it, I was started dabbling into the films, and that's what started the uh, film restoration part of the website, which is ImageWorks. And that begot a podcast, which is where we are today. So that is the, you know, the uh, simple history of where we are. Of course, if you have any questions, you can let us know any more. Uh, but uh, I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the team here that we've put together. And uh, I think it's a great team that we've got. We're going to be taking you on a monthly journey back uh, into the uh, back into the annals of, of Disney World. Like I said, from way back uh, uh, pre dawn if you will all the way up until about 1989 or so which is where kind of my personal cutoff is but anyway without uh without any more of that let's uh introduce the first uh person of our team uh Hal Bowers uh welcome aboard he's a a wonderful uh addition to the team Hal say hi to the to the world here aloha aloha <laughs> <laughs> How is a master of mixology and and all things tiki, as I said, right? That's right. Um, <clears throat> the enchanted tiki room is kind of like my gateway tiki drug. So as a kid, <laughs> that's what got me started. And then as I grew up, I found out, oh, well, what do you know? There's this whole Polynesian like uh, 
sort of like subculture with cocktails and <laughs> Hawaiian shirts and all this other stuff. And I figured out, well, there's all these things that I just love, like all kind of rolled into one little genre. So That's right. I was finally able to like pare down some of my collection and I'm like, <laughs> let's just concentrate on some tiki stuff for a while. There we go. How yeah, would I kind of... Go ahead. How and no, I no, kind of met on uh, Twitter, and and we had a really weird way of uh, almost meeting, I guess, about a month or so ago. Um, we were both at uh, an Orlando theme park. It wasn't Disney, but uh, we he tweeted out a picture of his son standing next to the shark uh, at Universal Studios, and I said, "Wait a minute! I was just there not thirty minutes ago and took a picture of my son." And we we literally missed meeting each other by happen chance almost by thirty minutes. So it's kind of neat. So uh, uh, and and now we get to spend at least an hour together. Exactly, an hour a month. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> what we get. So, uh, how a little bit about your Disney background knowledge? Go ahead, uh, let the world. Yeah. Know. So my first trip um, to Walt Disney World was in April of 1971. So we missed opening just by hair. Um, I had a cousin and a brother-in-law that actually worked construction on the park. So my brother-in-law uh, laid the rails uh, in um, the um, the Grand Prix, um, and he was a crane operator there. So so he did a bunch of that stuff, and, and he did a good job because my son wails on those things, and they don't <laughs> seem to come out. I know it's like what, forty some odd years later, and it's still in there. Yeah. Um, so we got to go to the preview center. Um, which was which was pretty cool back then, and we also because we had relatives who were working, we got to take a bus trip, like out onto Main Street while it was still under construction. Wow! And my parents told me, I, I mean, I was only three, so I have very either vague memories or false memories of this. <laughs> um, but they told me that looking at the state it was in in April, that they could not see that there would be any way that it would be open by October. And everything that I read about the way things were, that was pretty much the situation. They just rushed in at the end to get everything done. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so after that, we went every year from from 1972, um, usually in April, until I finally moved to Orlando in 1979. And then when relatives came, it's like we we always took them. So I was pretty much a steady Walt Disney World goer at least once a year from 72 to about 88. And then I took a little hiatus and then started intensely going again in the mid 90s and then have taken a, like a little break since then as well and just go casually. So there we go. Yep, we got yeah. you back in the retro. <laughs> I, not many people can say that they went there before it even opened. I and mean, that's pretty cool. I mean, even yeah, your age, you didn't remember all of it, but that's that's pretty, pretty cool. I'm a very so, lucky Disney nerd. There you go. <laughs> All right, so let's introduce uh, Brian Miles. Uh, Brian, welcome aboard. Uh, we're glad to have you here. Let's uh, let everybody know a little bit about your background and uh, where you're coming from. Well, thank you, Todd and Hal and everyone. Uh, my first trip, I may have been the latest there because I don't know when JT's first trip was, but my first trip was January of 1988. Uh, so kind of... Uh, uh, six months later is when Norway opened, so I missed the full spectrum of Epcot Center by six months uh, at a, at its peak. Uh, but I went uh, with my parents. It was a Christmas gift, a surprise Christmas Eve of 1987. They they let us uh, open these envelopes that said we were going to Disney World the following month. Uh, so we were down there for five days and did uh, uh, the Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and SeaWorld. And uh, I came home from that trip. Uh, with two or three things really burned in my mind. Uh, all of Epcot, really, but specifically Spaceship Earth, and then the Tiki Room in the Magic Kingdom. Uh, and they were the things that stuck with me. Uh, I did not get back there until uh, 1995. Me and a group of three friends who had graduated high school with me three years earlier. Uh, I have, was bound and determined to get back, uh, so I made it back then. Uh, and then I started going on a regular basis, and by regular, I mean at least once a year uh, in 1998, and that's been pretty much the the standard. I've uh, stayed in probably three quarters of the resorts, uh, visited Disneyland Paris in 1999, which was fantastic. Yeah, you're a uh, world I remember traveler too. <laughs> I, I remember almost nothing uh, from it. Uh, I have a couple of pictures. 
Uh, you know, it is 15 years ago. Uh, there are bits and pieces of it that I remember. I remember the dragon under the castle there, which is neat. Uh, and then I've been to Disneyland twice in 2006 and 2011, and I'm probably going to go next year. There we go. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I've, uh, much like you, I got bit by the noticing the things that weren't there anymore when I went back and remembering them and uh, discovered the Twitter community two years ago uh, when I attended Epcot's 30th anniversary conference uh, that weekend and uh, in, in the fall of uh, 2012. And that's how I ended up meeting all of you yep. and getting involved here. And Todd and I actually hooked up because yeah, I you're had the, you're uh, like the master of garage sale films. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had an interest in eight millimeter films, 35 millimeter slides, older older photographic media uh, f because my grandfather was into all of those things. So we have films from my childhood and the slides are actually from my dad's childhood up through my oldest brothers and sisters. Uh, so that I'm fascinated by that. I digitized all that for my family. Yep. And then I picked up a couple of, uh, a couple of films of old Disney trips uh, and after I got them converted or at least viewed some of them, I didn't know what to do with them. Uh, and that's where my connection with Todd came in. Exactly. And that's so right. that ultimately led to me being here. And I promise you I'll be far more interesting in the conversations <laughs> than my history. So that's it. Fair enough. Well, we have to thank Brian, too, because he has, he's the one that found um, what probably has become one of, the, one of the two top films that we've restored. You found the 1971, I call it the pristine film, because it is just um, it's a, Disney World is a maybe six weeks old in the film the, the, it was in impeccable condition the colors are unbelievable um we're going to talk about more about that on in a future episode um but yeah brian's uh pointed out we both uh are have a keen eye uh he, he seems to find them before i do a lot of the times but he's got that garage sale uh ability as well so so we welcome brian and then our Thanks. last but not least jt um welcome aboard you Give a little background on you. You and I, we've you've been writing on uh, Retro Disney World pretty much since we opened. Uh, I think uh, been a kind of a guest star, if you will. You've tweeted out <laughs> pictures from your trips on our on our account. But uh, yeah, let's uh, talk a little about your background and we'll go from there. Yeah, um, I've been writing on the site for what is it like two years almost now, off and on as things kind of pop in my head. I am kind of one of the people, though, that I don't remember the old days as well as some of you. My first visit was about 1985, and at that point, I was barely walking and, you know, don't really <laughs> remember much. But my time period is right around your cutoff. I remember visiting the studios the first year it opened, doing the 10-hour backlot tour, uh, that kind of stuff. But what sort of sparks my interest in it is the the stuff when I do walk around the parks and you see something that is old and it is retro it is vintage and you're like wow that's i wonder if that's been there since opening day or that's something that's changed or whatever so uh the other thing that really uh is fun for me is getting on ebay and finding the stuff that people are selling now it's just insane what this old stuff actually goes for you found like the, uh, it, the contemporary matchbook the a couple other yes i just love out. that there was yeah. matchbooks like just freebies everywhere that's just hilarious to here me. kids now here, you, yeah pick this up in the hotel room burn it down <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's light up after Space Mountain. I need a, a quick. Pick well, me up. how there was a picture of you. You were outside this the cigar shop and Disney. It was a Disneyland or Disney World with the cigar. That was Walt Disney World. It yeah. was Disney World. Yeah, yeah. So you know, give away cigar. You let the kids stand in front of a cigar Indian and you know give the away Main uh, Street matches. tobacconist. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly. oh exactly. I, and they had packaged. Um, they actually had packages of like special Walt Disney World tobacco for pipe smoking because wow. pipe smoking was incredibly popular back in the seventies. Right, right. You could get you could get canisters of a special formula of tobacco in the uh, Walt in the Lake Buena Vista shopping village. They actually had a tobacco store there, and they had special blends of of Disney tobacco. Amazing. There's a podcast uh, topic uh, right there. We need that. Well, then we're going to have to mark our iTunes as you know not safe for kids. So yeah. <laughs> we've got to be careful. I mean, so, just like who who out there actually bought Disney tobacco? That's well, insane. It's like the people that bought uh, you know Disney Disney candy, Disney runs, right? You know all that stuff. Yeah, but yes. JT, you're, you you know, since uh, I don't mean it's negative. You're the youngest of the group. I, I consider you. You're no, kind I of, agree. You're the stick that's going to poke the bear. And I, I said that when we first started talking, which is awesome because. 
you know, people are going to say, oh, you know, what are people that haven't been there you know, long and don't remember the past? What are they going to offer? Well, that's the whole kind of key to our show here is that as we start talking about this new stuff, um, you can ask those pertinent questions, you know, wait a minute, you know, when did that part change? Or I remember this, and that's going to all help spark our, our conversation on this, which I think will go really well. So oh, totally, um, I, t I agree. It's, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to ask you what this queue looked like instead of what it is. And you guys, you have no idea, JT, you have no idea what it exactly. used to be it was so much better. <laughs> All right, so the next segment here, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the format of the show uh, for for future episodes, so that uh, our listeners can kind of understand how we got this thing set up. Um, you know, after introductions, which won't be as long as what we just did, we wanted to give you guys background of who we are. Um, we're going to go into a main topic. Uh, that topic is going to vary from week to week. Um, it is going to stay, as I said earlier. Uh, somewhere between pre-opening up to about 1989, we may start to dabble into MGM Studios, but there's just so much between Epcot, the Magic Kingdom resorts and planning that we want to talk about. Uh, that's really where our focus is going to be. Um, the next segment, uh, we'll go into viewer mail, which is uh, JT. JT is going to take us through uh, anything that you write in to the podcast at RetroDisneyWorld.com email address. And those can be questions, comments, um, suggestions for topics, whatever you'd like to do. So it's our viewer mail segment. Uh, the next segment after that will be the audio puzzler, which is a chance for all of our listeners to win great prizes as, as we set that up. Uh, maybe a yearly prize, but we're going to talk about that a little later because we do have our very first puzzler, uh, audio puzzler for this for this segment. And then um, we're also going to dabble a little bit about the film restoration. Sometimes we'll talk about um, specific films that uh, I've recently restored or something that somebody submitted to us. Uh, this being our preview episode, we're going to um, talk a little bit about preview of, of three of the uh, interesting pieces of film that we have coming up that we're going to be restoring. And... Um, kind of give you a sneak peek at that uh, in future episodes we may even go through it a little longer and not go frame by frame but talk about what we're seeing in some of the films and explain some of the things so that when you sit down and watch it um it may bring some color uh no pun intended uh to, to the film Man. for you <laughs> it should be it brings some sound to it i should say uh and then we'll close it out uh most of these podcasts are going to run you know probably a little bit under an hour is what we're shooting for uh i'll keep everybody uh involved and uh keep everybody listening. So without uh, going any further on that, that's our format. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to kick off our, our main topic for, for this podcast and the preview podcast. Uh, most appropriate place to start we could think of uh, is the preview of Walt Disney World. Now, as Hal said, he was down at the, the uh, preview center as, as a child years ago, got to go in there early. Uh, so how you know, you and I have no doubt poured over some of these awesome books that are out there. there. I have the complete edition about Walt Disney World, which was sent out to corporate sponsors. I have the little uh, note attachment in there from Pete Smith and mine. Uh, you've got the preview edition um, souvenir book. Uh, there's the master plan. There's just so much information out there about what was going to be. Uh, it's really interesting to compare, you know, what these showed and, and what we, what really came to, uh, came to light. It's uh, it's actually amazing. And if, if you even go back a little earlier and think about, you know, the Progress City model uh, mm -hmm. that was up on top of the Carousel of Progress in Disneyland, uh, I think personally, I think that was them noodling around with what Walt Disney World could be. Because as we all found out later on, it's like, oh, well, there's Epcot. It's like, right. that's Progress City. That's everything that's spelled out in the Reedy Creek Improvement District, like a nuclear, the ability to do like a nuclear power plant and <laughs> All this recreation. Well, what do you know? It's all sitting there in that model, and somehow Walt managed to get someone else to like pay for them to develop that. Right, right. And I think it's fascinating that had things gone, it's like that that thing that was sitting there, it's like would have been Epcot City, and nobody knew it. Right, until right. years later. <laughs> and, and and for those listening who you know the the model where it now resides, if you if you re, if you ride the People Mover, um, what's left of that model is still sitting there. Um, and, and it's just amazing that that, that's what we could have, you know, could have, could have seen if things had gone differently. Um, yeah. it's not the full thing. It's smaller. Yeah. I get cut. How it, it was much bigger than that, right? How it was almost like, it was almost like, the, I want to say full it's circle, about that. right? Yeah. So I think we've got like maybe about a third of it. Yeah. Where'd it go? Is it gone forever? Is it like trash or. 
Super yeah, dodge. dumpster. <laughs> Don't talk no, about that's that. That's a sore bad. subject no. for a lot. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. But it yeah. had the, it had the. I believe at one time the trains were going back and forth. I remember seeing film of it with the the circus um, or the the carnival area, things moving. I mean, it was a incredible model to really demonstrate, you know, what this prototype could be. There's a great film that goes with that too. Um, the actual Epcot film that that uh, Walt Disney produced when he was talking about. Um, you know, bringing everything to Florida I had this wonderful animation and fantastic vision of, of what that sea was going to be like and how it operated in all the rings, which, which was amazing. So yeah, the master plan, I mean, just, it was, it was that, that's exactly what it was. It was a master plan and, and uh, it, just the very part, the park was just the beginning. Yeah. In fact, it seemed like what was kind of uninterested in some ways about the park it's like he knew there was going to be a disneyland but that <laughs> yeah, really i did wasn't that already what's the he's need? like yeah well we need something to bring in people but that wasn't that really wasn't his thing but yeah. i mean we're talking about you know an airport of the future that that was something and not just the stl port but like they there's legitimate plans for something called the airport of the future like sitting around that they never built right and they figured they'd put that very south on the property then you had epcot proper kind of sitting in the middle um, with mostly with the, the big resort hotel that you see and then sort of the international shopping center inside the building part of that. Yep. And then as you headed off north, it's like you'd get into the industrial area, which kind of ended up being future world. But the original concept was, oh, we're going to have, you know, GM and other big captains of industry who pay in to like set up manufacturing facilities and things so that people from all over the world can come and tour and see how American ingenuity gets it done. Right, right. Uh, and, you know, you and then... Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you, you look, I'm looking at the very final master plan here, and it's amazing that the layout of where they expected things to be, the residential community is where Lake Buena Vista is. We all know why those condos and treehouse, those were all going to be corporate places to rent and stay. The entrance complex is where we expect it. Epcot is a little to the north, uh, really where the industrial park was going to be. And I mean, here's some stats. They're thinking 100,000 visitors at the 20-year mark. Um, that's the annual daily average and uh, the jet port alone or the future port, 2000 employees with 500 motel units down there and the entrance complex, 5,000 motel units. Interesting. They refer to them as motels back then. <laughs> <laughs> Dates it. Definitely much, much classier motel. Yeah, that's right. but, yeah. motel. So yeah. Um, how, what do you remember about the model and, and how the model and the pictures we've seen of it? And when I, I'm I should clarify the model of the Seven Seas Lagoon and Bay Bay Lake, how that compared to some of the older drawings that we've got uh, on file. And, and, you know, I know you have interest in the Polynesian area. Yeah. So I think the amazing thing is so much of that was in flux for so long. Um, there were definitely some things that were kind of nailed down. Like they, they most certainly had the concept of the park and then you have Bay Lake and the seven seas lagoon. And, and they certainly were planning on having the hotels that we see, uh, on these maps. So, I mean, besides the Polynesian, which we got and the contemporary that would, which we got, they fully expected to build the Asian resort, um, in the area where the Grand Floridian is now. Right, um, right. they wanted to do a Persian themed hotel that was sort of north of the contemporary where the facilities way uh roadway is now right it was interesting um, that that was going to be a monorail hotel so the the original plan show that monorail snaking through tomorrowland much like it does in disneyland and then making this hard loop around to hit the asian i'm sorry the persian resort and then on to the contemporary yeah and then later on when they decided not to run the monorail through um, they rejiggered that so that way it would be on the spur line where the monorails go off to the roundhouse. Mm -hmm. So I, operationally, it seems like that would be a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I have, I like, I'm not, I don't know much about the monorail operation, but from what I've heard, it takes a bit of figuring out and delays to like when they take a, tr a monorail on and off the track. And they would be doing that continually. Right. Because it was like almost like a one way trip over and then, yeah, bring it. Yeah. yeah. Just a very short trip. Very, yeah, would not would not work um, very well. And then there was the the Venetian Hotel too, which is well, that land has been rumored to be sinking. So yeah, <laughs> for forty and years. And the now. oddball about that one is like that wasn't a monorail hotel. Be the monorail was across the road, so the right. early 
the plans like don't show that connecting and that seems so unfathomable now that you would build well, a hotel on bay lake it's interesting i'm looking at the map from a complete edition and it actually shows the monorail splitting it going there now i've got to look at yeah, the map i'm huh. looking at the same thing and it's yeah now in the yeah, look carefully at the preview edition cover which i know how i know you have and it actually does show the monorail going there but that's post split but also hmm. shows the persian hotel I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, the seventy-one fun map that um, that I saw, the Paul Hartley one, it's like they they don't show it attached, which is bizarre. So, so that just shows it, the state of flux that this was in. That it was just, it, yeah. All and over tomorrow, the place. I mean, we'll get to Tomorrowland, but Tomorrowland was a mess. It's like, <laughs> it really. <laughs> I don't yeah. feel like they knew what was going on there at all. No, I mean, you look at some of the early pictures and, and you know, the Tomorrowland as we know it, it looks like a giant circus tent held up by rockets, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's the yeah. best way to describe some Jules of Jules Verne the, thought that up, don't that's worry. Right. This is Jules Verne, <laughs> precisely. So, really interesting in the, in the way we thought about that. So, uh, you know, the thing that's amazed me, too, is if we go back um, pre-opening... Um, you know, we're kind of jumping all around here, but you think about how Disney pulled this off too. I mean, he bought all this land um, quietly under all these different um, fake corporations, was flying out there in his aircraft, uh, doing surveys from the sky, figuring out the parcels of land he wanted to buy. You know, in today's world, uh, somebody of that nature couldn't even get in an airplane without twitter going off you know so oh, absolutely not it, yeah it's such a such a different time and it, it amazes me that all this was able to be pulled off um and we all know why he did it he, he saw what he produced in disneyland he didn't like the motels cropping up literally across the street i mean they're there till this day you can't you know can't walk anywhere without getting bombarded by something else um and, and as he said that what he what they had there was the blessing of size that's what he was basing this all off of um so, yeah, there, there's there's a couple other great books out there that show some early pictures of Roy um, after Walt's passing out in the in you know out in the forest essentially of Florida, and it's amazing to see. Good luck, Roy. <laughs> yeah, he was left well, a lot to do. It's it's um, it's probably appropriate to mention Roy's cabin at this point. Oh, that's right. Uh, that's there's right. There's this uh, this cabin that was on the property when they purchased one of the parcels. Uh, and Roy actually stayed there uh, when he came to town. Uh, they held meetings there. There are f photographs of this cabin in the background. Allegedly, it is still on property in a state of disrepair somewhere in the wilderness. Yeah, I you don't know where uh, though. I believe I tried to locate that with Google Maps. How I don't know if you've if you've seen this, but I believe if I'm remembering this correctly, when I did it maybe a year or two ago, I believe it's located. Um, up in the far, that'd be southeast quadrant of of Bay Lake, um, but as as the lake starts to turn north, there's these little bit of inlets, and maybe it's further up on the north side. It could be on the east, but I remember finding a path, finding some really weird looking outcroppings and some definite indication of some buildings. So. Um, there's a podcast. <laughs> there's yes. an, there's an episode. The there's an excursion. That, well, okay. Well, <laughs> why uh, wasn't that on the backstage magic tour? That's yeah. The, yeah, no. yeah. Why wasn't that set? So. Roy's cabin. Roy's, yeah, Roy's cabin. So, um, the other interesting thing to remember too is, uh, you know, when they were doing this as well as Epcot, is sponsorship was huge. You know, we, you look at the construction. Um, getting the contemporary, you know, United States Steel, not only did they help build the contemporary, uh, but they made promotional films about it that are still out there that you can see. School that they, buildings, hospitals, yeah, we, we will use this model. Well, not only the model, it was it was to promote their business structure, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they could do these. And it, it was a modular building, um, as was the Polynesian. Most people don't know that. There was a lot of slide in buildings. What's the analogy they used? Like a chest of drawers sliding the room. <laughs> that sounds everybody, about right. Yes, <laughs> that's everybody right. knows. <laughs> um, you know, that that's actually a good film to watch is the United States Steel film. It may put some people to sleep. Um, yeah. <laughs> it may put a lot of people to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm also, I'm looking at another early map here too that shows a larger piece of property and i'm 
I'm wondering what this is. This is would be located, I could only describe it as um, pretty much southwest of where the Polynesian is today, not too far off. A very strange pentagon-looking building with a very open round area and a globe in the front. Do you know what, anybody know what that was? Yeah, I think that was their early plans for the golf resort. Oh, okay, before they moved it further north. Yeah, and changed the architectural style. Because I've, I've seen the same thing. Mm -hmm. and I, I, so I think the ball is like probably representing like a giant golf ball. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> oh, very clever. Oh, we know where that went. That went to, okay, <laughs> reuse that idea, <laughs> which is really interesting. It's it's so funny because you, you flip through these things so many times, and every time you, you, you go through, you see something new that you've never even seen before. Um, we also can't forget, too, that, that that area was a, what a massive swamp. I mean, uh, th the work that they did to drain and, and bring that down was um, pretty amazing. Yeah, Walt really picked a rough patch of land. I mean, I don't know if there was much <laughs> good with it other than just the lake and the cheapness of it. But Yeah, yeah. well, it was it was the most expensive uh, private construction at the time, too, which is, which is really interesting. So, um, yeah, and you know what's funny, too, is you can even, even some, some of these fake i shouldn't say fake but these very cartoony maps you can really get an idea like if we kind of start to look at the magic kingdom what was there uh, the inclinings of thunder mesa are there at such an early early time you knew that concept was they were excited about it from the start um you know twenty thousand leagues is obviously in there the the swan boats are actually just represented by literally swans in a pond <laughs> you know <laughs> sure <laughs> but they were they, they were there uh the 70s. Know, yeah i mean this one i'm looking at everything is incredibly out of proportion but it really gives you an indication of of uh you know what they were looking for and what they're looking at so uh, amazing stuff so um how what else you got i know you've got all sorts of goodies on the pre-opening oh let's see well there's so many things to talk about so yeah i mean it was obviously a giant piece of land which they had to drain so that system with the the french gates to like control the drainage i mean i think one of the things that's really phenomenal is uh it really was everything they did there was absolutely cutting edge for the time and that's one of the things that people forget about mm -hmm. like they were using new systems everywhere so this whole like no power drainage system where they could control everything. It's like absolutely groundbreaking doing a utilidor, absolutely groundbreaking um, having an AVAC system for garbage collection. Mm -hmm. First place in the United States that ever did that. They started their own telephone company because they couldn't get anyone to do it the way that they wanted to do it. I assume. So they laid, they were apparently one of the first places to run like underground phone cable. And then later on, they were like the first place to run fiber optic telephone cable. So um, despite the fact that they were always fighting, you know, price and trying to get sponsors to pay for things, it's like they were doing everything like to the absolute best that it could be. And that to right. me is one of the one of the coolest things about this is like afterwards, it's like we take this all for granted now. But like after the place opened in the 70s, like tons of architects and actually respected people would go take tours there to find out how in the hell did they do this? Because <laughs> right. nobody else in the United States, like people talked about doing this kind of stuff for years and years and building a new city from the ground up, but nobody really did it. They right. pulled it off. Right. And, in and a swamp. Yeah, in a it's swamp. In, it's, it's like Monty Python. It's important to note two things. One, they did it twice because they first did it with the Magic Kingdom and the infrastructure of you know, Buena Vista Village and the roadways and all. And then they did it a second time with Epcot. And at the time they were doing this, and especially Epcot, which was a billion-dollar project when it opened in 1982, they were a fairly small company. I mean, people forget what a tiny company it was before Michael Eisner quintupled the size of it over a span of, of 15 years. It was a relatively small company to accomplish such gigantic things, which I think is why people have such an affection for the old company. Yeah, it, it was a different time back then. And even with the sponsors that still barely got them to where they, they wanted to be with Epcot, obviously the visions have changed. That's, lots now, what did they open there. with Coke or Pepsi as their sponsor? <laughs> which Pepsi. Pepsi was, was, was Pepsi was the Magic Kingdom, yeah. Yeah, Pepsi yeah. was the Magic Kingdom. They sponsored Now, my uh, understanding is that you could get both of them up oh, until... Really? 
<laughs> up until the 90s when they signed the, the Coke signed thing. on Coke yeah. um, to do the American Adventure. And I kind of remember both of them being available. I remember Pepsi, Pepsi, the big sign over Country Bear because they sponsored right. Country Bear. And actually yeah. to this day, I think it's to this day, we'd have to check the pictures, but... Um, there was a, a, a circle where the Pepsi logo used to be, and then that was covered up with just kind of this brown or whatever yellow paint. Uh, Sweet design. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just kind of hidden. And I know Frito was in uh, the Golden Horseshoe, mm-hmm. or I should say the Diamond Horseshoe, because um, they just had like bags of snacks and, and right. drinks in there. So I think they kind of like had a lock on Frontierland sponsorship. And then we, we had, uh, you had Oscar Mayer on Main Street USA. You had Borden's, which begot Seal Test, which I don't even know what the ice cream is today. There was another one after Seal Test. Um, so yeah, sponsorship uh, was huge and, and, and really changed the layout of everything over the years. Um even today. Yep, even I th- today. I think I think it's Edie's today. Is it e- Edie's? Okay. I think it's Edie's. It's Starbucks. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, don't. Yeah, Starbucks. We're not going to talk about that. That's you know, that's what it is today. I, I should it's preface. It's better than tobacco. <laughs> it's better yes, than tobacco. Yeah, maybe just advice, as addictive. <laughs> um, I, should, I should tell our listeners, they're probably going to ask, um, and I probably should have started the podcast saying, they're probably going to say, oh, are you going to talk about Frozen or, you you know, are you going to comment on, you know, what happened when, when X ride changed to Y ride? And here, here's my answer to that so that we can kind of get that out of the way. And I'm glad you guys kind of brought it up there. Is that, uh, let's just take the fro- Frozen example. Um, no, we're not going to discuss what we feel about Frozen coming in. That is a topic that other podcasts and other websites will handle ad nauseum. Uh, it's not our interest to talk about those on here, but what I can guarantee you we will talk about is that if something happens like that, then we can certainly bring what that attraction was before the changes to the podcast. You know, I I fully think Maelstrom was awesome. We can do a whole podcast on what it, what it was. I've got this affection for Willard Scott opening it. I, I just love the video of him getting all excited and, and getting all creeped out and not going on the ride. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, Sasquatch girl. Yeah, 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 exactly. But that's what we want to focus on. We want to focus on what uh, the things were like when we remember them. What were they like back then? How do we remember them? Um, so that's really where our primary focus is going to be. So if you want to hear what we think about things changing, not the place to come, but uh, we'll certainly tell you about what the way they were. So um, with that, guys, I think that's um, kind of got to wrap up our, uh, our pre-preview, if you will. Um, Obviously, if anybody has any questions on any of this material that we talked about tonight, um, preview stuff, I mean, we could dedicate, what do you think, how, five, six podcasts, just <laughs> if not more, oh, yeah. just to the pre-opening oh, yeah. stuff. Uh, and, and I'm sure we're going to do another, you know, uh, we could dedicate an entire one to just the resorts, another one to what Tomorrowland was going to be. Um, yeah, we've got a, a lot to talk about. So, um we're going to move into our next segment here, um, and this is our, our viewer mail segment. Uh, JT is going to lead this one here and, and, and uh, send us off here with one of the questions uh, some of our viewers wrote in. Now, the reason we got viewer mail, you're probably saying, wait a minute, this is your first preview yeah. episode. How did you get this viewer isn't mail? fake, I promise. <laughs> it's yeah, real. No. This is actual viewer mail. I, I did two podcasts, uh, WW Fanboys with Brett, and I did Intercot with John over there. And uh, I, I thank them. You know, that's kind of what sparked this whole thing. Um, but as a result of that, I, I did get some questions come in via email um, about certain topics. And uh, I don't remember what they were. Uh, I forwarded them off to JT. And uh, <laughs> as we're, the way we're going to do this is that when he asks it, it's pretty much the first time we've seen the questions um he's going to pick out and we're, we're just going to kind of round robin here answer them and um I, what do you got you got one or two of them there for jt what do you got i got one and i'm going to do this like phil donahue style like i'm going to hold the microphone you know the whole deal um, <laughs> there you go this is this will kind of go off of what we talked about a little bit as far as the company size and you know what what it's like today and you know going back and thinking you know to the retroness of it um is disney creating lifelong fans now like we are lifelong fans of Disney from, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But is this something that nowadays, I guess you could say, is there going to be fans like us? 
Hmm. And who's this, come from, who's this coming from? This is from Andrew, our friend Andrew. Andrew not okay. Todd McCartney, a fake question. This is a real <laughs> this email. Is a, a real, it's a, Todd, real that's Todd in a fake mustache. <laughs> this is Todd. Uh, I don't know who he is. Hey, right. you, you don't see me. Uh, you know, that's a, here's my answer to that. And this is going to, I have to be careful because I'm going to, if I answer this incorrectly, I'm going to overstep the boundary that I just set yes. three minutes ago. I made this uh, challenging. The first you you did. You did. It, it's, it's giving <laughs> me challenge here. I answer it this way. We, you're creating new fans for different reasons. Uh, to me, I've become a fan because of the history, um, because of the way I remember the parks and, and what they instilled in my memories. And it's also a bit of personal history. Um, because my grandparents were the ones off of footing the bill. It's a, there's a lot of memories and a lot of good feelings that come with it. Um, but again, what, what gave me those feelings was not just my grandparents, but the whole, the whole feeling of being down there and, and the history and, and looking at these books that we're talking about. Um, and that's, a, 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 you know, a fan because of memories. We are, st they are still creating fans of memories, but they're creating fans of memories off of franchises. And I think that's where it starts to get different. And um, Disney, as we talked about, it's a large corporation now, bigger, bigger fan base for different reasons. Um, it's no longer the parks are no longer a place to go and experience um, something so outlandishly different that you can't see it anywhere else. You know, you got to remember back then, '71. I mean, you got a sky bucket ride. There were very few of them, or there was very few um, places to drive a car or descend in a submarine. Yeah, you know, there's so many more parks around the world now where you can do very similar things. So they have to differentiate themselves, and and need to do that through franchise. So that's my answer. I'll I'll turn it over to somebody else. Let me else. ask this though. Let me bounce off, and we'll go to Brian here, and you can answer this part. Is Disney preserving the memory that we are talking about still? Are they doing a good job at that? You know how we mentioned earlier, you can buy a submarine voyage T-shirt now. Are they keeping us interested and new people interested in the old stuff? I think they have to, otherwise we wouldn't have a podcast. No. <laughs> no, they, they, they are. I think they're turning around and realizing they were abandoning it for a while, and um, you know, I think they're starting to realize it now. I'm not willing to go as far as Todd. I think that part of part of what has changed, and and this is a larger discussion, maybe someday. But the big thing that's changed is. Uh, from the first days that it opened, really up until the first half of the Eisner era, there was one or two guys making decisions. I'm going to do away with Thunder Mesa and put Pirates of the Caribbean here. I mean, one guy made that decision, and then the company jumped and made it made it do it. Uh, Michael Eisner's kid likes Splash Mountain's <laughs> model in the Imagineering Workshop, and he decides we're going to build it in Disneyland. Um, things don't happen like that anymore. They answer to stockholders. There's divisions. There's a merchandising division. There's a hotel uh, hospitality division. There's a restaurant division. Um, and the point is, I think that the merchandising people have recognized that vintage merchandise, there's a market for it. It's a market that doesn't buy their frozen stuff and doesn't buy Little Mermaid stuff, but will buy something that says, uh, you know, enjoy the sky ride with an attraction poster from 1971. So I think that's there. Uh, I don't necessarily know that there's a I haven't certainly seen in the last few years some great resurgence of interest in history. I think there are some attractions they've invested in, Country Bears and Tiki Birds. Two Captain of the EO. Captain okay. EO. Well, I don't know that they invested <laughs> in it as much as they capitalized on it. But, yeah, th that, that stuff is there. Uh, in terms of the experience, mine's not different than Todd's. One of the strong attractions I have to the place it's the only place I ever went on a flyaway vacation with my parents and my brother and sister. Uh, you know, I live in the suburban Philadelphia area. We spend our summers, our vacations in the summers at the Jersey Shore. It's an hour and a half drive from here. We'd rent a house. We'd go. Disney World was the only time that we ever got on an airplane and went away somewhere with my parents. And so when I'm in Epcot and when I'm in the Magic Kingdom, there are places that I have vivid memories of you know the younger me with my parents you know my dad's not here anymore i don't know that i'll ever go to the parks again with my mom uh and so that draw is there and those memories are going to be there for kids going there today yeah. 
but I do think everything Todd said is right. It's, it's a different kind of experience now. And for a lot of them, it's, um, for parents, it's almost a hurdle now. You know, it was a very special thing back then. Now, for a lot of these folks, go it's an expected thing. Yeah, it's if you're expe- a kid, you're, yeah. you're expected. It's an to expensive go. thing. Yeah. Your kid gets made fun of if they're the kid in sixth or seventh grade who's never been there. You know, now, and, now and Hal lives parents. in Florida, so Hal, you got kids, so a little different down there, right? And it's also the Polynesian Village again, so we got to go with that. They brought that back up. That's got to make you happy. I can tell I can tell you that there are certainly people within a two hour radius of Walt Disney World that are season pass holders that are taking their kids there every other weekend where it, it is a playground for them. And those kids are probably the luckiest kids in the world. And, you know, they're taking it for granted um, probably a little bit compared to, you know, like when I grew up. And again, it was a once a year trip that you would come down and take. Um, they have access to it whenever they want. Um, there's, there's a lot of those people out there now, and there's a lot of people now that are even moving to Orlando as adults, um, and choosing to live there so they can visit the parks. That's unheard of up until the 1990s. I'd say like late nineties, two thousands, like you start to see that phenomena. So in the past where you had, you know, Disneyland annual pass holders, like left and right through the, through the eighties and nineties, it's like, that's just starting to happen now in Orlando. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of effect that has. Yeah, that's interesting. They take it from a local. <laughs> <laughs> was there an yeah. annual pass when the park opened? Does anybody know that? Why? Why was, have, it was like two dollars and seventy-five cents to get in. Why? <laughs> there was a light. Twenty there bucks. Was a li- there was a lifetime pass originally that you could purchase. Wow. And it was. It was. I, I don't know the amount, but it was an amount of money that today it would obviously still be valid today if you would. Does anybody it have then. one? Like anybody still walking in with that old piece they of cardboard? Exist just... like a legend. Uh, they're <laughs> like the wave machine. They exist. But there we go. Uh, we we like, now like, have another holy grail. Let's another holy, somebody yeah, out there. Yeah, let's yeah, see throw a, that out there. There yeah. was but such your, a thing though. Uh, to your point, I mean, admission was five dollars. It's right. like if you, because the the attractions were separate from from actually your walking admission. So. For five yeah. bucks, you could get in. It was two dollars to take the ferry boat or the monorail over to from the TTC into the Magic Kingdom because that was a separate company, right? For whatever yeah. reason. And, <laughs> and if you go through the book, The Florida Project, and I don't know who wrote it, but I read it, uh, it deals with all of the the uh, legislative battles to get the approvals in Florida to build it and the secret purchases of the land and everything else. And uh, it's actually written in the legislation that there had to be discounts for Florida residents, that there had oh. to be, which is why you have the Florida passes. And mm. I don't know yeah. how brings up an interesting point uh, because there was no life, what they call the lifestyle or community. Now that the people who move there, live there, go to the parks on a daily or weekly basis, uh, and and move to that central Florida region to be in proximity to the parks. Obviously, that that didn't exist in 1971 or even up through the 80s. Uh, but you know, you talked earlier in the show about Walt being able to come in and out of Orlando and not be noticed. I mean, there it, it's impossible to explain how there was nothing there. I mean, it really was <laughs> like if you picked the most desolate middle of uh, Nebraska and decided I'm going to build a, a you know a, an empire here. Uh, that's what Central Florida was like then. There was just nothing right. there. Right. Uh, so we talked earlier in the show about uh, who would buy tobacco. Uh, there was a very good chance, and, and this has been talked about before, uh, they had a wine store in Lake Buena Vista. And for wine connoisseurs, for consumers of wine, to have a, a, a 2,000-bottle shop uh, in central Florida when they <laughs> would have time. to have driven hours right. to get either drive to Tampa or drive, you know, uh, that was, th- that's what Disney did for that central Florida community. Right. Uh, so, so there's, there's a lot there in terms of economic development, in terms of building the, the foundation, normally people come and then the businesses build up around them in central Florida. Disney did it in reverse. Right. They built this Probably massive like business empire and then people came. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and and they really did use Lake Buena Vista to draw in the locals. It's mm-hmm. like they were co- – like the, all these things that you see now, like the frozen things that they're doing in the parks, it's like they would have done that type of thing at Lake Buena Vista to bring in people 
um, for a weekend or whatever. It's like they had Halloween parades with like as jazz, a kid, I jazz yeah. festivals, uh, top musicians, all that. Yeah, they, yeah. they had yeah. one of one of the guests that we'd like to get on here is a famous artist, and uh, he was down there showcasing his paintings at Lake Buena Vista in the seventies, and they flew him down there. You know, not not only do you have the locals, as Hal mentions, uh, you've also got what they were still trying to cater. And and wine and dine these corporate executives to spend the money on the condos, uh, which you know begat the, uh, the which I forget the name of it. What what, what was the name of the um, the places to stay at Lake Mia Vista next next to the tree houses? I can't remember what they called them. But you know, oh, now Disney Saratoga Institute. Springs. Now Saratoga yeah, Springs, then, but they, they were yeah, all there. Yeah, Vinci is sued in before that. I think it was. was I the, even, I'll have to look yeah, it up. Well, yeah, that was the. Um, Oh God! Yes, yeah, see, we're, we're all blanking. Lose, all right, we're going right. to lose our retro. Card. <laughs> That's right, exactly. Yeah. That's it. It, it. These guys aren't retro. They can't. But to your point, name. they tried so hard to make the Epcot concept work, even into like the middle to late mid seventies. Oh yeah, it's like there were snippets re- of it. Yeah, they that plan from like seventy five or seventy six to run a people mover through Lake Buena Vista and build that series of of uh, corporate like five or six story buildings or the sun bank was the very first one. And they were going to have about three or four of those in a row yeah. and then run a people mover down into, to reuse those, those condos that they built and like, and turn it into a community. It's like, it's mind boggling. They tried so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Every, every <laughs> part they, of that master plan was, was pulled and taffy stretched, if you will. And, I'll, and I'll throw, I'll throw one of my, uh, my side tidbits here from that, from that book. Uh, when they were building it and going through the legislation, one of the things that Walt was concerned about, and then later Roy, uh, they didn't want any of the people who lived there to be able to vote on anything. Uh, oh. So it was actually the scheme they came up with was that a holding company would actually own everything and it would like sublet to these people who would live there, but on like a nightly basis calculation so that they weren't actually residents, uh, so that they in the end wouldn't actually have the right to vote um, and, and have any say in what happened in Reedy Creek or, right. or Lake Buena Vista or wherever they happen to be. Living. I mean, fascinating stuff that they had that they had to think about. Yeah, right. Because yep. they had that, what, like four or six people that actually lived there. They had like, those uh, people. In the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was it. Was JT? It was Andrew who wrote in, right? It was Andrew. You said his name was. That was Andrew. Yes. Andrew, well, Andrew, there is your uh, your answer. Yeah, there's uh, your your to one question. You sent us a couple, but and you, you can know. notice the trend. We just go retro deep with it. So, um, yes, I, I, I appreciate you writing in and uh, look more. So, JT, uh, tell them where to write. Yeah. Um, any questions? Anything like that? podcast at retrodisneyworld.com uh we'll get that email sent to us and we'll possibly read your question uh live on the show the next time excellent sounds good all right well our next segment um i'm going to talk about the name of it in a second i I have to take a brief moment here to kind of give a little (laughs) background on it um the idea comes from car talk uh if any of you listen to the npr radio show that features tom and ray magliozzi uh, they're better known as the Click and Clack, Click and Clack, uh, the Tappet Brothers. Um, I, I've been a fan of that for a while, and uh, they have a weekend radio show that ran from 1977 to 2012. And I think you're, you're probably going, oh, where's this guy going right now? But they're in cars, too. They, they are in cars. They were there rusty and dusty rusties in the movie. You got it. So, uh, who was Lightning McQueen's sponsor? So I didn't know what to call the segment. I, they have something on there. Uh, on their show called Puzzler, where they they do an audio thing where they talk about um, you know little little puzzles that you try to figure out and you come back next week. And I, I kind of like the idea. Um, I really didn't want to call it Puzzler because that's that's theirs, uh, even though they've retired the show for. Um, however, I, I did learn today that uh, Tom Magliozzi passed away this morning at the age of 77 after a, uh, a b- battle with Alzheimer's and. Um, I think as a you know as a fan of him and and just in general we're just going to call this the audio puzzler um a little bit of a tribute there and a little bit more definition around it so here's the way that's the background and here's the way that the audio puzzler is going to work we're going to play about a 30 second sometimes 15 maybe um uh, audio clip it could be could be a narration it could be some music a you know musical score could be a song and Look, we're not going to be playing anything like When You Wish Upon a Star here. These are going to be a little bit harder to guess. And um, this is going to be from some past attraction or, or one that's been modified in some way. And uh, 
if you think you know what it is, you can send your attraction guesses to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. And each week we're going to pick a random winner from those who send in the correct answers. And at the end of 2015, we're going to pick from all those uh, monthly winners for a grand prize. I don't know what that grand prize is yet, but we're going to make it good. Um, and uh, we are going, going to win Roy's cabin. You may, nice. you may win Roy's cabin, or at least the directions to three nights. One free night. <laughs> so um, there are no hints in this. Um, you know, the guys may talk during this, and we may kind of go, oh, wow, okay, I don't, I don't know what this is coming from. But um, also, too, the music may not line up with what we talked about so um so anyway so here we go this is um this is this this week's puzzle or sorry this month's puzzle or at least for our preview edition it sounds like star wars if you ask me yeah so we're gonna run this for about 30 seconds here and no hints no hints how it looks like I, mean, I know where it. I've heard it. I've heard it before. Like, I'm sure, we all have. <laughs> two, two, Oops, three is that years. A, is that a hint? In the park, in a hotel somewhere. All right. Well, there it is. That is this week's uh, this week's audio puzzle. So, if you think you know the answer to where that's from, uh, just the attraction name is good enough. Send it to podcast at retrodisneyworld.com. All right, so moving on to our final segment here is film restoration. Um, normally what we will do, as I discussed earlier in the podcast, we're going to pick a film that we've restored, and, and we're all going to sit here and watch it and kind of talk about it and say, wow, did you see that? Look at the 132 mark, look at the 215 mark, and, and, and talk about different things there. Um, we're running out of time here in, in, in what we want to do, so what I thought we would go over here is talk real quick about what the restoration process is so everybody can understand what we're really doing behind the scenes. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, three films that we have to restore yet. Uh, so the restoration process, um, a lot of people have said to me, uh, you know, why don't you just work with video or anything like that? And uh, I'll be straight up and honest, video from a restoration perspective, you can only get so much out of it. There's a term out there I've heard a lot, and I continue to use it. It's called polishing the turd, uh, because you can only do so much with video. People think, oh, video was great in the 80s. We got video. It, terrible. I wish we had stick with film until high def. Um, the reason being is it's very simple. A film, when you have an individual frame for um, on the, on that film, as computers and technology have gotten better and better, we are now able to scan that small little frame at higher and higher resolutions to the point where we can scan that frame with a higher resolution than the best camcorder could have ha ever done towards the end of its, um, into the end of their lives. So now the technology has caught up, we can scan all these in, uh, we can crop them, we can take them to the high def, uh, all the films that we do are scanned in at 1080 uh, resolution. Uh, and then we can actually, even t through the computer, we can add frames to it because the old film was actually filmed anywhere between 16 and 18 frames per second. Movies are 24 and television is about 20, 30 or so. Um, so we can actually, the computer can make up the frames that are missing between 18 and 30 and you get a really, really smooth picture instead of that stuttered look that everybody is used to. But aside from that, what, what really goes on in the in the restoration process, um, we start off with the digital scanning that we talked about, and what's returned to us is a uh, is is a is a uncompressed file that has essentially the every single frame scanned into it, um, along with the audio track if there is any, and uh, the computer software that I use um, compares each frame to the next one, and also compares it to the previous frame. And what it does is it looks for dirt that's in one frame but not in the other and then digitally removes it. It also compares the grain from frame to frame and figures out what is real color and what is grain. Uh, it goes through and sharpens it. It brightens up the colors, it all sorts of color control. And a three-minute film will generally take anywhere from 20 minutes for the very first pass and then it can take about another 20 minutes and another five minutes for the final compression. So the process... While I don't sit there for the whole time, um, the setup is generally anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour, depending on how finicky the film is and what quality and what condition it's in. Um, and uh, from there, you, you crop it and get a beautiful print. Um, people have to remember, too, the films that were taken back then 
and I've said this on other podcasts and, I, and I'm going to say it again here is that um, when you went to Disney World, you had an expensive camera, you had expensive film at maybe 10, 12 bucks a cartridge, something like that. It may be a little cheaper. You went in thinking that if I'm not buying another cartridge today, I have three minutes, maybe six, maybe nine <laughs> to shoot your entire day. And it's incredibly evident. We, you know, um, uh, Brian's been able to find some things on on eBay that we've transferred, and it's incredibly evident to watch uh, how people treated that film. Uh, one individual easily spent quite a bit of money, and the one we were talking about, the seventy one film, used top quality film, used top quality processing. And to this day, it looks like it was shot yesterday. Other than that, Tomorrowland's under construction, <laughs> but um, and then. I had another individual I looked at and he spent, you know, for one cartridge and he got his entire day in three minutes. And we, we don't do that today. We got cell phones. We pull them out. We just start taking pictures, everything, not even thinking, but every shot meant something. His trip around the monorail, you know, it's three frames of this, and four frames of that and five of that and three of this. And it's, it's jumping all over the place, but he was so nervous in the beginning of the day that he wouldn't have enough film. And then towards the end of the day in the middle, he starts to relax and he's starting to shoot a little longer and a little longer and getting the family in the shots. Um, and it's, an, it's amazing to watch these and, and put your head around what the people were thinking when they shot them. The 71 film that I was just talking about, the guy couldn't have cared less or the girl, I don't know who <laughs> shot it. Couldn't have curled, cared less about his family. There's not no. a single shot of people in the entire film. <laughs> it's not all, worth it. Nope. No, I mean, well, why well, am I going to? It's really rare because Todd and I have watched enough of these things where it's, oh, it's the monorail shot, it's the castle <laughs> shot, it's the parade, yeah. it's the fife and drum corps in right. front of Liberty Square, and it's the same stuff on every one. And then it's the family jumping around in right. front of the camera, standing there, running up and grabbing, you know, the little pig's tail or something. Yep. And so when. You, when this particular film uh, came in, when you find one where the person goes and takes a panoramic shot from in front of the, the ice cream s store uh, across Tomorrowland Plaza, across the hub, uh, all the way over to... And know, a nice gentle you're just pan. watching it saying, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, and you're watching it saying, my God, I've never seen this view before because no one was taking films right, like that right. then. I mean, they were they were taking little Johnnies jumping up and down in front of the train. Yep, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've got, you know, 30... How knows about this? We were discussing the 34 reels that I recently bought, and I'm not going to restore them all because a lot of them are just there's junk but there's some fantastic things on there which one how i know you're excited about this one right this is your the city of future living from space mountain oh yeah yeah the home of future living that was uh, i can't tell yeah yeah he's um, he's he's glowing with <laughs> speechless yes yeah, speechless. i was terrified of roller coasters but i would force my dad to stand in the like 90 minute space mountain line skip the ride and then go through the go home of future livings accident. just so I could see that. And God bless him. He put up with that for years and years. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got that coming. I forget the exact time on it. I think it's about a minute and a half, two minutes. I think it's the whole trip up the ramp and everything. That's all there. Um, yeah. I don't Good know. Your the... speed ramp. Yeah. This speed <laughs> yeah. I can't get enough speed ramp. <laughs> it's like needs more cowbell needs more speed ramp. <laughs> <laughs> They were at the Goodyear World Headquarters here in Akron until a year or two ago. You could run. My sister rode them every day into work. A speed ramp. I'm really? not kidding you. Yes, wow. right, right Look at Maine them. Goodyear Headquarters. Look at that. Well, what did they do to them? Uh, they're the building's still there. I haven't been there for a number of years, but they're at a new place now, and I don't know what's in the building now. But they were. I rode it up one day to visit. I was like, oh my gosh, a speed ramp <laughs> in Akron, not at Disney <laughs> yeah, World. Exactly. This is way cool. Uh huh. Um, the other two that we're working on, so the city future is going, we have, um, a 1975 press film. Uh, this is 16 millimeter. So what you've all seen before so far is eight millimeter. So this is twice the size uh, of the frame that we've been doing with eight millimeter. So we're, we should get some fantastic resolution out of this. I don't know what's on it. I don't have a viewer. Uh, it does have sound, but it was a 1975 press film sent out, um, obviously to the press by the Walt Disney company. Yeah, if you're old good. enough, if you're old enough to have uh, watched projected films in school, <laughs> yeah, you know what sixteen. School, right? There you go. That's what a sixteen millimeter film. You'd is. always get the one that got stuck; it would melt on the screen. Or, or my best one was—I remember it was our uh, biology teacher. She didn't realize that the film broke, 
it was still running through the projector, but she looked back on the floor and there was a good, you know, 50, 60 feet of 16 millimeter <laughs> just dumping on the floor. Oh so, my. Yeah. Classic. So, uh, on the films, 35 millimeter th- film strips. That's, we'll leave that to another podcast. For, and that's not ours. <laughs> uh, and the last one that we have, I am personally ecstatic about this. It did ship. It is in route to me. This is, seems to be i'm going to guess between six and ten minutes uh, based on the film length that i can see i'm just hoping it's good this is epcot center from october 14th 1982 13 days after opening i any idea I, what's on it no absolutely no it, it, it could wow. just be pans it could be just as brian pointed out kids jumping up and down i don't know all i can think of is that 13 days after opening, if somebody spent that money in 1982 to, you know, I was going to say videotape, but to film it, then I have a feeling it's probably decent. That, you know. I I mean, the experience of going to Epcot for the first time back then, uh, it's impossible that it's kids jumping around because right. it, your your instinct was just to look around and wonder, yeah. Yeah. you know, wide-eyed. And I can't wait to see, you know, I want to look for construction walls. I want to look for Horizons construction evidence. Uh, Living Seas, well, that didn't come for, for another four years. So there's probably nothing there. No construction yet. Um, you know, the barren trees, a, a view across World Showcase without the uh, pointy swan and dolphin pointing up. So, I mean, <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, they were still the building, buses. they were building Horizons and they were still building inside imagination. So. Right, right. So there's going to be a lot yeah. of cool stuff. So I world, predict there will be there. long lines everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Every attraction <laughs> will have incredibly long lines. Yeah, that's right. Out of it. That's a good point. I didn't think about that. So here is our, our uh, I'll throw out my little, um, you know, ask to the community out there if you have any films that you'd like to see restored, uh, please by all means let us know at Retro Disney World. Um, more than happy to help take a look at them, uh, help you get them restored. We do have coupons up on the site um, so that you can get money off your your uh, digital transfers, and uh, in return for that, I. Uh, go ahead and do the restoration for you for free. So um, if you have any questions on that, check out the image work section of RetroDisneyWorld.com. Christmas All right. is coming. Christmas is, is coming. Yeah, get them in now. Idea. Get some, yeah, get them in now. And if you, the, the there are Holy Grails we're, we're looking for. We should probably write That's down That's what I was going to bring up. Yeah, we got, <laughs> we want, we talked on surfing. Uh, we wanted to get the, somebody surfing on the wave well, machine. we want to see a functioning wave machine. Yeah, functioning wave. I don't care if anybody's you have a film, if you have a film or or slides of the wave machine in action yeah, at we the have, Polynesian, we have pictures of the wave machine, but no waves, so we know it was no waves. Off. So we want to see the film. And my personal one: uh, if you have a film and there's a giant talking orange, not talking, <laughs> a giant orange posing with kids in uh, Adventureland, yes, uh, for pictures. I personally w- am dying to see a film of the orange bird walk around characters. So. Absolutely, that's another great one. How? What do you have, man? Actually, that's even that. There's not a lot of pictures of the orange tree that was in the bar, uh, oh, yeah. in the juice bar back there. So anything like take a, if you take a step into the juice bar and have a picture of the sunshine tree. Yep. With either one of the two orange birds that were in there. Cause there were two different orange birds in that and tree. One move. One was animatronic, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We yeah, actually, we the one that we got back is the first non-moving orange bird. So the reason he ended up in a drawer somewhere, if that story is true or not, is because they actually replaced him with something better. Um, yeah. Cause that one that's in there now to me is looks kind of off model, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I'll take off model versus nothing. Yeah, ex- exactly. Isn't exactly. there a boat we want to a Bob around boat or oh, what yes. is that called? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Now I have footage of, I, I got some footage of the Bob around boat tied up. So it's not bobbing. It's not going around. It's not doing anything. <laughs> it's more of a tied up boat. It's the Bob and place boat. The Bob and place. Yeah. Um, a Bob tendered. around. Yeah. A Bob around moving would be great. Um, it would be fantastic. I, I do have some shots of early contemporary, uh, anything of the resorts early, early, early. Uh, we have some quick shots from David Coolidge of the, um, of the Polynesian pool way back when. Uh, but um, anything grounds around Lake Buena Vista is another one that we, I, to this day, I always call it Lake Buena Vista, but what people know now is the Disney village marketplace, whatever. Um, there was a, a climbing structure out there and people call it the whatchamacallit. And it was yes. this orange seventies splinter ridden, 
monstrosity <laughs> is the only way to describe it. I just climbed needed on some it. Thompson's water sealer. That yeah. just... <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> you're going into sponsorship now. Looking, I guess, yeah. sponsored by Thompson's water sealer. <laughs> but um, uh, I I may have I I have some film from 1981 I have to have done yet, and um, I'm hoping I remember climbing it. There could be some film on there that. Um, how anything else you're thinking of? Dude, that thing, I spent so many hours in there. Um, <laughs> Remember putting your hand out through the holes at the top? Oh, yeah. The ho- yeah, yeah I, that the was holes. the best hangout spot right there. It was the awesome. End. Yeah, you felt like um, you were a mile high. And then there was that sort of like crawl through with the big circle in the center, mm-hmm. like underneath the... Uh, so let's see. Anything like pri- before they figured out in California that it's super hot in Florida and they needed to cover it. So, right. so the fact that like uh, – so teacups without the awning on top of it uh, like actually yeah. moving. I've, yep. seen, I've seen a couple still pictures but like um, Haunted Mansion without the awning. Yep. Um, that that stuff is priceless. Um, uh, Tom Sawyer Island under construction because that didn't open with the park. That was a late opener. Big Thunder um, Mountain th- construction too. Yeah. That oh was Mike yeah. Fink, big, Mike Fink big, keel boats. Keel boats. Yeah, keel boats. Um, and, um, or the canoes, even for that matter. Yeah. It's like that would all yep. be great stuff because you, you used to be able to get so close to some of those animatronic deer and elk and things on those yeah. canoes. Yeah. Well, the thing's only yeah. three feet deep to the end. You could go anywhere. <laughs> there is no shore <laughs> to get stuck on. <laughs> well, and, there uh, we go. Oh, yeah. 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 So we've got. Well, we could probably do a whole episode on just We're taking requests here. Yeah, That's take requests. <laughs> Here's your request and dedication, right? So, um, all right. So with that, guys, we do have to close out here. We're a little over time, but uh, this was our first uh, preview edition. I hope everybody uh, uh, enjoyed it. We are going to keep to a tighter schedule next time. I um, appreciate everybody for listening along, and uh, I do have a couple of thank yous here to, to close out. Um, first and foremost, uh, Joshua Harris of EpcotLegacy.com. Uh, he created our opening f- theme montage. Um, Andre Gardner uh, did the voiceover and our welcome theme as well. I want to thank him. Jason Bartell for the retro uh, Disney World podcast logo. And uh, also a shout out to those guys over at Intercot and WW Fanboys for lending, uh, lending me a hand and uh, getting me into this by having me on their show uh, twice each. And uh, really kind of got me the idea of doing this um and also to our listeners out there even though this is our first podcast and uh isn't really our official one yet i appreciate everybody's enthusiasm we've been getting nothing but support and getting this thing started and going um everybody's really been great and given us a you know uh, a lot of support and looking forward to it so I, I thank all of you for listening and um we don't have any sponsors yet so if you are interested in in sponsoring this podcast in any way shape or form please email info at retro and uh guys uh thanks to jt brian and how uh, appreciate you joining with me tonight and uh we look forward to the next one. Our our uh, next episode one, or I should say, our next episode number one is going to be, we're going to take you back to Tomorrowland, um, to a time where uh, that land instilled some vision and promise of the future, and it was kind of in the middle of a space race, space age at the time, and uh, wow, I could, I still remember it to this day. I'm getting excited about it already. So yeah. <laughs> that will be the official episode number one. So until then, guys. We're out, right? Yes. Thank All right. you. Bye bye. Till next, next time. Please stand next... clear of the doors. The doors. There we go. <laughs> Over and out.